Welcome everyone to uh, Japan's 2021 elections, what to watch for. Uh, my name is Daniel Smith. I'm the Gerald L. Curtis Visiting Associate Professor of Modern Japanese Politics uh, and Foreign Policy in the Department of Political Science at the School of International and, Polit and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Uh, and this event is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Study Center at Columbia University. Uh, I am delighted to have uh, three of my good friends and top experts in Japanese politics to give us their thoughts on uh, what to expect and what to watch for in the upcoming House of Representatives elections, which, which will take place on uh, this coming Sunday, October 31st. Um, our first, uh, we're going to go in the order that they are listed on the event uh, program. So our first speaker will be Tobias Harris, uh, who is a senior fellow at the American, at Center for American Progress, where he oversees the national security and international policy team's work on Asia. Uh, from 2013 to 2021, he was a political risk analyst covering Japan and the Korean Peninsula at Taneo Intelligence. Uh, he's the author of a, a, a the veritable tome, the iconoclast, Shinzo Abe and the New Japan, which is the first English language biography of Japan's longest serving prime minister. Our second speaker will be Amy Katalinak, who is assistant professor in the Department of Politics at New York University. She graduated with a PhD in government from Harvard University in 2011. Uh, and before coming to NYU, was a visiting assistant professor at Harvard University. She's the author of uh, Electoral Reform and National Security in Japan, From Pork to Foreign Policy, from Cambridge University Press. Our third speaker is Kenneth Mori McElwain, who is professor of political science at the Institute of Social Science at the University of Tokyo. Uh, he's originally from Ireland, but was raised in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and has worked at a number of universities, most recently as assistant professor of political science at the University of Michigan before moving to the University of Tokyo. Uh, the way this uh, webinar will work is that each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. If you have questions that you'd like to submit to the speakers, please use the Q&A function to submit them. And after our speakers have gone through uh, their thoughts, uh, I will present some of questions from the audience to the speakers, which they can then address. So without further ado, uh, Tobias, would you please uh, start us off? Thank you, Dan. Um, this really is a conversation among friends, and I, it feels like this should be happening in Izakaya, in Izakaya over beers in Tokyo. And, and it's really a shame that um, that we haven't been able to do that. But hopefully, I, you know, I look forward to being able to do that. And this will have to do for now. So thank you, um, and I really look forward to, to hearing what um, Kenneth and Amy have to say as well. Um, I'm going to just try to set the stage for uh, this election that is coming up on Sunday. A uh, very abbreviated campaign. Um, and you know a very quick turnaround from the LDP election that ended last month. Um, so we're, you know we've had we've had quite a busy season, um, and you know this election, uh, I think there have been signs that it could look a little different. But um, I, I think what we really need to ask is whether this is going to be the first election of a new era of, of the post Abe era of something new, or if this is going to look more like a continuation of the elections that we saw during uh, the Abe years. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I think the, the defining feature of what we saw from elections during the Abe years was first and foremost, low turnout. In election after election, you had uh, record low or near record low. So starting in 2012, before Abe technically was prime minister, you had turnout fall to what sounds like a really high number of 59%. Um, recalling that in 2009, when the DPJ swept into power, turnout was, I believe, something like 71%. I mean, some very, very high number. Um, and it plummeted in 2012. And then in 2014, it plummeted again, and it fell to something like 52%. And then in, in 2017, I guess you got something of a dead cat bounce, and it, bounced, it was back at 53%. So basically, year, you know, cycle, election after election, you had uh, voters basically deciding to sh not show up. In particular, I think, uh, independent floating voters deciding not to show up. And I think that's what really mattered. So the dynamics that you had um, in election after election was in general, the LDP's organized vote showed up, Komeito's organized vote showed up. Um, maybe the hardcore supporters of the opposition showed up, but they were relatively few in number. Um, and in general, you had a lot of people who decided to stay home and basically voted then or, or you know, voted with their lack of using their feet. Um, and so you had Abe, I think, coasting um, on this, la this relative lack of interest um, from independents. So it wasn't that he was getting you know, tons of support or that he was well loved by the public. The public, I think, basically decided stability is good. We're okay with this. 
Um, Abe is not doing anything that's too alienating, that's making us too upset. Um, and so we can sort of tolerate this. And actually, I, I think that actually became more apparent over time because you got to the end of the Abe years of the 2017, you have uh, scandal after scandal. And, and that's you know the story and the opposition tries to run on that. And the public basically ends up shrugging, right? I mean, you know, you still had low turnout, even with this attempt uh, to show that, you know, okay, the Abe government has, has done all these corrupt things and we can't trust them. And it didn't actually end up mattering. I think the public really ended up preferring stability uh, over even the slightest hint of change. And so I think that was the dominant feature. And so the question heading into this election, is it just going to be like that again? And, you know, there's not, you know, you, we have to kind of go off, you know, data, you know, data points here or there in, in the polls that we've seen. I can't say that I've seen polls that suggest that we're really going to see uh, a big change. I mean, maybe you get a couple of points here or there, but, you know, certainly it's not going to look like 2009. You know, I think we're still dealing with, uh, what I've taken to calling on Twitter as a persistent low turnout environment. And I, and I think that's um, the case. And, and I think that explains what we're seeing um, both from the opposition and from the government, uh, from the ruling coalition in terms of how they're approaching this election. So to start with the opposition, because in some ways that's the bigger story, um, what, what we've seen, of course, is the Constitutional Democratic Party, which formed during sort of the crazy, uh, that crazy period between the dissolution of the diet uh, in, uh, in September of 2017, um, the potential formation of a Koike led party that uh, ended up fizzling in some ways. Um, and then sort of her Koike's decision to expel a number of, of uh, members of that new party uh, from the former Democratic Party. We don't have to go into that long story, but basically you've got the constitutional Democrats emerging from this chaotic period uh, headed by um, Edano Yukio, who had been the uh, chief cabinet secretary back uh, during the 311 crisis. Uh, and in that chaos, they actually had, I think, a surprisingly uh, successful performance, given the short amount of time that they had uh, to put together a campaign. And they've spent the last few years trying to build, I think, the organic base for a new party. And to some extent, that hasn't succeeded, that they haven't gotten the sort of um, the, in, the improvement in numbers, uh, the recruitment of candidates at lower levels that they had wanted. And as a result, they think they've had to really go to great lengths to try to form an alliance with the Japanese Communist Party. And so to some extent that actually has succeeded. And I think you've seen the Japanese Communist Party decide to be strategic about a, a general election in a way that it really hasn't before. And the result of that is that they are actually gonna run the fewest candidates uh, in the single member districts in the, the lower house election uh, that we've seen under the current electoral system. I believe that number is 106, which is something like 100 candidates fewer than they usually run. So usually what they've done is run way too many candidates in a lot of places, maybe some of those candidates, you know, they had no chance of winning anyway, or the opposition had no chance of winning anyway. But you have lots of candidates running in places where they're maybe getting 10% of the vote, 12% of the vote, maybe in the last in the last election, even more, um, and more than enough uh, to make up the difference between the, the LDP or, or the Komeito candidate and the opposition. And so in a lot of places, you're going to see more competitive races just because the opposition is coordinating. And that's really, that's, it's a response really that if you can't count on lots more voters showing up, the opposition has realized that they have to find some way of making races competitive. And really the question then, is that going to work? Is it going to matter in enough races to really make a dent in the ruling coalition's majority? Um, that remains to be seen. I think there are a lot of races, particularly um, in the Tokyo area, I'm about to be interrupted by a small child, um, in the Tokyo area and in Tohoku and Hokkaido, sort of to the east, or east <laughs> to the east of Japan, um, you're gonna see more competitive races. Daddy. But there's still a lot of races, um, Osaka area and west, where there's just not, you know, the LDP just has such an advantage that even opposition coordination isn't gonna make that much of a difference. And so yeah. I think this is only gonna take you so far. Um, and I think you also have to consider too, that over, as a long-term solution to the opposition's challenges, um, I think the cooperation with the, with the Communist Party has, I think, uh, caused some issues with organized labor, which was the major supporter for the Democratic Party over a lot of years. And, you know, I think in certain districts that's had some real, that's had some real issues. You've also had the LDP, I think, really run on red baiting. And I don't know how, I don't get it. I don't have a strong sense of how much that's actually worked, um, but I'm sure there are places where it's, where it's helped. So um, as a long-term solution to the opposition's challenges, I don't know if a cooperation between the CDP and the JCP is a long-term answer. Ultimately, they have to get voters out to vote. Um, quickly on how the LDP has responded to a low persistent turnout environment. I think the response to it is the fact that Kishida is prime minister. I think, you know, they were presented with the choice between sort of a, a more exciting, uh, uh, 
you know, Konotaro, someone who, who really could appeal to independents, uh, maybe would have actually gotten people out to vote for the LDP. Um, instead, they opted for Kishida, safe, maybe a little boring, um, you know, not someone who, who's going to get independents terribly excited, but also might not inspire people to turn out to vote against the LDP either. Uh, and sort of is sort of the same bet um, that the LDP, maybe a continuation of the kind of uh, politics that you saw really, particularly during the late Abe years, where people weren't excited about Abe, they didn't love him, um, but they didn't feel excited enough about the opposition or strongly enough to turn out to vote uh, against him. And that, I think, maybe is the bet that the LDP made on Kishida, uh, at least looking at the numbers and looking at the kind of polling um, you know, the, we're getting different numbers and, and Asahi just dropped its latest round of polling, but it looks like the bet might pay off that the LDP is going to succeed in enough places, um, just maybe based on the fact that turnout is not going to go up greatly, uh, that the Kishida bet might work. Um, before uh, I finish, I just want to just put these out there just as numbers to remind people of the numbers we're dealing with. Um, the LDP, the LDP and Komaito have uh, roughly 40 or so seats they have to play with before loot before they, they really get into trouble because they need they need to stay above 261 right now that I think they're 304 or 305 um, to have uh, a, an absolutely stable majority and that gives them control of the committee ships all the chairmanships and if they can stay above that number they're fine and that you know I think that's what they're they're aiming for and and looking at the numbers I think that's actually you know 40 is probably um, it's probably reasonable that they can stay at or or just under 40, I think, just looking at the numbers. They start getting beyond 40, you know, get above 44, then their control of the parliamentary process gets a little more complicated. Um, it's going to get a lot harder to really move things through. Um, and politics could get interesting again. But uh, I'm going to leave it there. I think I've come pretty close to 10 minutes. And I, and hopefully that at least uh, left Amy and, and Kenneth with enough to uh, to comment on and, and maybe uh, disagree with. Um, thanks again. Thank you, Tobias. That was probably the most uh, thorough accounting of the current situation um, possible in 10 minutes, even with children uh, scampering into the scene. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, next up, we'll have Amy Katalinak. Amy, when you're ready to share your screen, please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Dan. So let me just begin by saying, yeah, big thank you to Dan for having me tonight. And I'm really happy to be here and to be discussing this with all of you. So I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna expand on some of the themes Toby mentioned and also introduce some, some new themes. Okay, so early last week, the Japanese media reported two opposition parties, Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan and the Japan Communist Party had reached an agreement to field a single unified candidate in 213 of these 289 districts, these 289 single seat districts. So this was big news. This meant the, the Communist Party decided to withdraw candidates from 21 of these districts, which is what's driving this uh, single unified candidate. So this is big news. But I have to say that the reactions of some of the LD, LDP heavyweights made me chuckle. So let's look at these reactions. So Amari Akira, the Secretary General, he said, which one would you choose? A government of liberalism and democracy? or a government incorporating communism. The biggest focus of the election is gonna be the choice of government. Then we have Aso Taro, who's the deputy vice president of the LDP right now, still in, still in the diet, even though he is a former prime minister. So Aso was quoted as saying something like the constitutional communist party is being created in many parts of this country. But the most, the quote that gave me the kind of biggest uh, pause was the quote by our uh, former prime minister Abe Shinzo, are they also still in the diet, uh, representing Yamaguchi 4? I had to search today. I didn't actually know if he had a job, apart from being sort of LDP kingmaker behind the scenes. But Abe says they are cooperating despite their totally different positions on security policy. This is a bid rigging style of cooperation intended solely for the election. Now, this made me chuckle because, yeah, bid rigging style of cooperation intended solely for the election with a party whose policy positions on security policy are totally different from our own. Well, that pretty much sums up what the LDP's electoral strategy has been for at least the past decade and past two decades, since about 2003. So for the last couple of years, for the last three years, I've been studying this bid rigging uh, style of electoral coordination, if we're gonna call it that, that can, be, that can be debated. So in my comments today, I just wanna talk about how it works how it keeps the LDP in power and factors that could cause it to fail. And I'm gonna try and do that really quickly. So, okay, any party like the LDP, majority seeking party, 
it, if it wants to win in the jury, it has, it has to pay attention to the electoral system. So Japan uses an electoral system that you, that's used in 28 countries around the world called mixed member majoritarian. It's a mixed member electoral system. It has two different tiers. So there's a district tier in which there are 289 districts across the country and candidates have to place first in their district to win. And it also has a list tier or a PR tier. So in Japan, it's closed list proportional representation as the electoral system in the list tier and first past the post in single member districts as the electoral system in the district tier. Another critical feature of this system is that the number of seats a party wins in one tier have to be added to the number of seats in part the, the number of seats it wins in the other tier. So if you're a majority seeking party like the LDP, you have to come up with an electoral strategy to win in the districts and win in PR. So what I've been working on this topic with my co-author Lucia Motolinia, who's going to be an assistant professor at uh, Washington University St. Louis beginning in January. Turns out that this electoral system creates a distinct strategic environment where a large party like the LDP and a small party can gain by cooperating. So how exactly does it create this environment? So in this electoral system, as in most electoral systems that are just, we call them majoritarian electoral systems where they're just all single member districts, large parties are gonna have incentives to focus their strategy on increasing the number of districts that they win. And this is the same in the, in the US, in Congress, there are single member districts, parties are gonna be trying to win more single seat districts. So in general, in a mixed member system like Japan's, this happens because large parties are gonna be more competitive than the small parties in districts, they're more likely to win them. And also if you're a party, a large party, you're typically winning already a lot of PR seats and you're winning a sizable number of districts. Now, where you should put your emphasis, if you have, if you have like finite resources and you want to win more, you want it to be, you want to use those resources and use your, um, use those resources to win more seats, you're going to focus on trying to win more districts rather than more PR votes because your more um, effort to win, putting more resources in is going to have a, a, a greater impact on your seat share uh, in a district rather than a PR, rather than a PR tier. So, okay, alas, large parties, especially large parties like the LDP, they are not equally competitive in all of their, in all of their districts. So the LDP went into this electoral system you having candidates who are really, really good at winning, candidates who are not very good at winning, and then candidates who are kind of like really bad at winning. So one strategy that you could use if you were a large party is that you could carve out policies that appeal to the types of voters in your competitive districts. So for the LDP, these competitive districts are mostly urban districts. So you could kind of carve out a platform that could try and make you more competitive in these districts. And this is sort of what I think many political scientists thought that the LDP would do under this new electoral system. And there was an indication that the LDP was doing this for a while when it had, say, Koizumi. But it turns out there's another strategy that makes even more sense under this system. You could try and get those extra votes in those competitive districts from a small party. So, and this is, I just want to emphasize, you can't do this if you're in, say, House elections in the United States because you don't have lots of viable small party candidates. But, but you do in Japan because you have this extra tier, this PR tier. So you can try and get extra votes in these competitive districts by approaching a small party. So this is what the LDP and the Kormato do. They divvy up all of the 289 districts. The LDP runs in 90% of the districts and the Kormato runs in about 4% of the districts. Each party's supporters cast their district votes for whoever is fielding the candidate in the district. The party fielding the candidate in a given district asks its supporters to cast their PR votes for the other party. So we call this vote trading, uh, but there is sort of more pernicious titles, labels that could be used for this electoral strategy. But what this means is the LDP wins many more districts than it otherwise would, and the Kormato wins more PR seats than it otherwise would. The reason why I think maybe bid rigging is not a terrible description of what's going on is that, we, that money is also involved in this exchange. So in this paper with my co-author, we discovered that the LDP Kormato governing coalition is using central government money to reward municipalities where party supporters are switching their votes as instructed. 
So hence, supporters of the LDP and the Komeito are able to get more money for their communities by casting their votes strategically. So maybe closer to bid rigging. Implications of this. By trading votes, the LDP is able to win more votes without having to win over more voters. So it's essentially using its supporters and the Kormato's supporters to win enough seats to govern Japan. It doesn't have to pay attention, pay anything more than lip service to the concerns of people who don't already support either party. So it can really just focus on pleasing its supporters and much of the time that's gonna be okay. Partly because turnout is low, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. So let's just talk about factors that could cause this electoral strategy to fail. So this is really thinking about this election, I wanna think about like what could break up this, co this coordination between the two parties. The first factor that could break it up is a breakdown in the LDP Cometo Alliance. Now, there's no point really talking about this in the context of this election because it's not happening. And it's also extraordinarily unlikely. The parties are gaining a lot from being in this alliance with each other. The LDP is gaining SSDs, many more seats than it otherwise would. Many of its candidates are supported by these Cometo voters and the Cometo is getting more PR seats. Also, the Cometo voters are also getting money for their communities by voting for the LDP. And I would also caution everyone to remember that spats happen in all relationships. So public disagreements between the LDP and the Komeito, they aren't necessarily evidence of a breakdown in the relationship because sometimes going public with your unhappiness with your partner is just a way of signaling your resolve, signaling how much you care about this issue so your partner is gonna give it to you. So the second factor that could cause this to fail, however, is an opposition coalition that's sufficiently inspirational that inspires many voters who are unattached to the LDP or the Cormato to turn out and vote for them. So this is sort of what happened in 2009. However, I think it's very unlikely that this is gonna happen in this election. So there are many numbers being bandied around in the press, people talk about support rates of the cabinet, people you know, talk about a lot of different numbers. The numbers that I just can't get past are these numbers. So this, the Constitutional Democratic Party support rate is 8% right now, and the LDP support rate is 38%. So in 2009, the DPJ inspired all of these floating voters to turn out and vote for it in the 2009 election. But we can see before the 2009 election, the DPJ's support rate was actually two to 3% higher than the LDP. It was, I think it was the first time there had ever been a party that was actually more popular in support rate terms than the LDP. And that was in 2009. And we are very far away from that scenario right now. So the Constitutional Democratic Party, I just, I just don't really see them sort of rising up and inspiring all these voters. And also, I, I got this great quote. And you know, to be honest, I don't understand this quote. I thought that my, my colleagues here who know more about baseball will be able to like understand what this means. But the article was implying that this quote meant that Edano himself thought that the, uh, the probability of a change of government is very low. He said it's the same as the batting average of Los Angeles Angels baseball star Shohei Ohtani. So apparently Ed Ono himself is sort of, you know, on the record saying, I think the probability is very low. So the third thing is, so I guess what I want to say is to return to the point I made initially about the coordination, it's not enough for the opposition to coordinate. They actually have to inspire these voters who don't always vote to turn out and vote for them. And I think that there's really a little indication that turnout is going to be high. So Tobias gave some of the um, some of the turnout levels. It's just been going downhill since 2009. And now we have another wrinkle, another factor that's going to depress turnout potentially, and that's the coronavirus pandemic. So the so Japan is you know it's great that we're at 70% vaccination rates in Japan. I read just today. But I, I just don't think that turnout is going to be high, partly because the opposition parties are just, they, they just aren't as popular as the DPJ was in 2009. So in some, I think the probability that the LDP loses on Sunday is very low. The question will be, as it has been for several elections now, how large will its majority be? But that is not because the party may lose. That's because the size of the LDP's majority will determine how Kishida fares. Um, in the next year, two years, three years, if we get that far. So thank you, I'm gonna conclude my talk there. Thank you so much, Amy, um, that was fantastic. And now we'll have uh, Kenneth McElwain. Um, uh, so whenever you're ready to share your, your screen, go ahead, Kenneth. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Kenneth McElwain from the University of Tokyo, and um, I want to talk about two things relating to the election. One of them is um, about COVID, uh, which Amy thankfully just brought up, and the other is something a little bit nerdier about why I think turnout may actually be higher than we think it's going to be. Um, so on COVID, um, the point that I want to emphasize is that under the uh, Abe and Suga administrations, any credit for um, handling the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been attributed to local, not national politicians. And there's a question whether that will continue under Kishida. And the second relating to turnout is this is the first election in three cycles that uh, the contest will be fought successively under the same electoral districts. And um, that may make it easier for candidates to coordinate, for voters to know who their options are, and therefore improve turnout. So on COVID, many of you have seen these figures. This is taken from uh, the Johns Hopkins homepage. Um, it shows a cumulative number of uh, COVID case counts uh, since March 2020, um, United States, UK, France, not great. Ireland, where I'm from, not as good as Germany, but better than the English. Um, and Japan has done much better than its Western counterparts, um, but poorly compared to its East Asian neighbors. Um, and there's a way in which the framing about COVID in Japan has been about comparisons to its neighbors, not to the West, which uh, to some extent has created uncertainty and doubt about how well the national government has handled the COVID scenario. Um, but this is possibly changing. And one major reason for this is uh, the rapid increase in vaccination rates. So Japan is here, uh, sorry, this is a few weeks old. Japan has now exceeded the United Kingdom in terms of total vaccinations. Ireland doing very well. Um, Taiwan was slower to get on the game as with South Korea, but East Asian countries are catching up. And with higher vaccination rates, um, COVID case counts and serious illness and complications, death has also decreased as well. So the question is, who do the Japanese voters think has been doing a good job under COVID? And our research team at the Institute of Social Science has been running, um, we've done seven survey ways. We'll be doing another one to, relating to the election. And this compares responses in May 2020, which is when the first uh, shutdown or lock, pseudo lockdown in Japan went forth, and in March 2020. 21, which um, is our last major survey wave. And we asked respondents on a five point scale where five means um, doing a good job and one means doing a terrible job. How would you rate different political actors in their handling of COVID? So on the, between the left and the right, between May 2020 and March 2021, there's very little difference. In general, voters think that the uh, doctors have been doing pretty well. Um, the orange is experts. So these are medical experts who are on the government advisory board. They're rated less well. Um, but two things strike out or, or stand out rather. Um, on average, the blue bars, which is how well the governors are being evaluated, or the evaluation for the governors is routinely higher than the prime minister. Um, the prime minister's rating is roughly about that of the media, which either says something, I don't know, I don't know who that says bad things about, but generally not good when on average you're below. Um, the, the, um, the mean. Um, I'm showing this data a little bit differently. This is in the March 2021 survey again. And what I've done is for each prefecture, I've plotted in blue the average rating of um, the governor and black is average rating of then prime minister Suga. And what you can see is the blue circle. So the rating for the governors are, are sort of distributed, I wouldn't say randomly, but there are prefectures where it's very high and prefectures where it's very low. Um, but if you look at the black circles, which is the rating for Prime Minister Suga, it is uniformly below three, which is the which is a neutral level. Um, I've marked out a couple of places that may be of interest. So in Tokyo, um, both the blue, the, both the black and the blue, which would be Governor Koike, are below three, but Koike is rated more highly. Um, Osaka, where the governor has been very active in social communication and so on, is rated much more positively. It has one of the highest ratings of governors compared to Prime Minister Suga. Yet another way of cutting this a little bit differently, because we would expect partisanship to influence how actors are evaluated. Um, and what I've shown here is the previous side was plotting governors and prime ministers. What I've done here instead is plot the net difference 
between prime ministers and governors. So above a zero means the prime minister is evaluated more positively. Um, below zero means the governor is rated more positively. And I've separated into um, respondents who classify themselves as LDP supporters on the right and not LDP supporters on the left. Um, so as was implied by the previous slide, there's a general shift towards the left, meaning in most areas, the governors are evaluated more highly than the national government. But it's actually true even if you're an LDP supporter, apart from some outliers like Nara, where my friends from Nara tell me the Nara governor is extremely unpopular, um, and Yamanashi and so on. Um, in most prefectures, at least Suga was evaluated less positively than the governors, in, uh, regardless of partisanship or even considering partisanship. So how will this change going into the election? Um, COVID case counts have, have plummeted in Japan. Um, as of, uh, so the count on October 26th in Japan was 203 people nationally. In Tokyo, it's been about 20 to 30 people over the last week. Um, and there's really no good understanding of why case counts have come down so much. It's probably a combination of vaccinations. People still wear masks almost everywhere and social distancing distancing continues. Um, but there are, of course, latent worries about the need for a third booster shot, as well as a sixth wave in um, this winter. So my question for this, and I don't really yet have an answer yet, is can Kishida change the narrative? Can he make voters think that the national government is doing a good job, given recent trends in case counts? Um, and if voters are ready to move move on from COVID is a, is a strong way of putting it, but do they still think they're in COVID, in which case they're going to prioritize public health, or do they think they're shifting towards a post-COVID phase, in which case they may care more about the economy and uh, you know, increasing the number of foreign visitors, including students and, and tourists and business travelers. Um, if voters are probably are prioritizing the economy, this may help the LDP because they are much more gung-ho um, on that dimension. My second point, and this is the, the more nerdy um, topic, is electoral district stability and voter turnout. Uh, so in any country, there's population migration, generally from rural to urban areas. That means that over time, you do have to engage in some redistricting of uh, how electoral districts are drawn up. Um, as more people move towards urban areas, there are fewer voters in rural areas. So if you want to preserve a uh, one person, one vote, parity or proportionality between the number of votes and number of seats, you need to periodically change the number of districts, or sorry, change the number of seats so that there are more seats in urban areas and also redraw district boundaries as necessary. Um, historically, there's been an overrepresentation of rural areas. So even as people have moved to urban areas, the LDP has not always um, been diligent about redistricting. So there are fewer people and fewer voters in rural areas. So the cost of a seat the, num the absolute number of votes you need to win was upwards of five to one. Um, so uh, it's one fifth of the votes in a rural area that's needed to win a seat than in an urban area. So this changed um, quite dramatically with electoral reform in the early 1990s, including the creation of a nonpartisan commission that's charged with redistricting. And one result of this is that the absolute, or the maximum level of malapportionment, the number of voters per seat between the least and most overrepresented districts fell from five to one to two to one, but it also increased the frequency of reapportionment, largely because the LDP, um, when, they, when, they do, when they approve redistricting by the nonpartisan committee, approves plans that are like 1.95 to one population disparity. So after five or 10 years, you need to redistrict again. Um, and one manifestation of this is, um, so these are posters that are showing how district lines and seats are going to be changed from election to election. On the left is before the 2014 contest, on the right is 2017. Um, but in the 2014 election, 13% of districts, which uh, influence or which houses 11% of voters were changed from 2012. Between 2014 to 2017 was one of the biggest redistricting, uh, particularly in terms of district boundary lines in post-war Japan, where 34% of districting, districts comprising 34% of voters changed. So I've been working on how over redistricting, um, which theoretically um, deals with 
malapportionment or vote to seat proportionality, um, how this weakens democratic accountability. Because from election to election, voters cannot judge their incumbents. Um, you're moved around to a new district. This has happened to me. I've had two different representatives from the same party, even though the people running have been constant because I've been moved to a different electoral district. Um, and if voters can't judge incumbents, then I think it's bad because you can't either reward or punish the people um, who've been in charge of uh, your welfare. At the same time, it increases the cost of information gathering because every election you have to learn anew who, uh, what your different options are. And as preliminary findings, what I've generally found is that redistricting reduces turnout by two to 4%. And that's particularly pronounced in urban districts where um, partisanship tends to be lower. So I'll end on this slide, um, which is, uh, so personally, I think there's greater excitement about this election than I remember about 2017. That may be because 2017 was a long time ago. And uh, there's research about election fatigue. Sorry, I put an alarm on myself. Um, it, it feels like there's been a major national election almost every year since 2012. So HR is the House of Representatives lower house, HC is House of Councillors, and local is uh, the national local elections, uh, which happens roughly around the same time. And for a long time under the Abe administration, there were elections almost every year. Um, but this is the first national election in two years, um, the 2019 upper house, and certainly the first lower house election in four years. And I think that means that um, not only are voters interested, there's uh, cohorts of younger voters who are now receiving more extensive kind of civic education, like voting, um, civic education relating to the lowering of the voting age um, a few years ago. So I think um, people are raring to go. Um, I think there's more informed decision-making because the districts are stable. And as Amy discussed, um, and as Tobias was discussing, opposition coordination is, is reducing vote fragmentation. So I think it's maybe easier for voters to make up their minds who to cast their votes for. But the, the downside is that um, this is the shortest period between the government being dissolved and the election being held, it's 17 days. Japanese election periods are very uh, constrained to begin with, but, um, the part that makes me less rosy is that there's less time to energize voters. Um, so I think turnout, I'm bullish on turnout compared to perhaps Tobias and Amy, but it's probably also not going to be a gigantic return to something akin to the 2009 election. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Kenneth. One, one of the wonderful things about pre-election uh, events is that there's lots of room for, for disagreements over uh, uh, predictions. We don't We don't have the data yet. So this is all kind of you know, looking into the future in our crystal balls. Uh, so we have about 80 people in the audience and there have been several questions submitted for, um, for our panelists. And I have a set of questions for each of you. So I'm gonna go in order, um, beginning with Tobias and then Amy and Kenneth and read some of those questions. And I ask you to keep your responses uh, brief so that we have time to get to all of them. So beginning with uh, Tobias, uh, Mohammed Al-Samahi asks, is Abe ever coming back to be a prime minister or will he stay in the shadows? Uh, and uh, Jan Rousseau from uh, Les Echo, a French newspaper, asks, has, this has the cooperation between the CDP and JCP forced the LDP to adjust its, its uh, campaign by talking more uh, about uh, redistribution, uh, for example? Um, <clears throat> to the first question, I mean, I guess we can't, we can't ever rule it out, having been, having been surprised once. Um, I, I am skeptical, though. I mean, I think um, you know, I think he's actually, I mean, in some ways, the, what we saw unfold last month um, was that actually he can wield power quite effectively um, as the sort of conservative in chief and, and sort of the organizer and, and leader of um, the LDP's uh, kind of right, right wing. Um, and, and he did that, right? We saw, you know, he, he basically propped up uh, Takeichi's campaign, um, you know, worked hard on her behalf. Uh, made her a viable candidate in a way that I don't think she would have been had he not done that. Um, and as a result, I mean, look, she wound up as the policy chief. And if you open that LDP manifesto, I mean, there are chunks of that manifesto that came right out of her book and right out of her personal uh, campaign platform. So, you know, we, you know, we're seeing Abe's influence to some extent. Um, I think that also might explain, uh, or at least partly explain why Kishida's uh, approval ratings have been relatively low that you look, um, there were a lot of questions about, uh, what the public thinks about whether Kishida should continue Abe's policies, what they think of the possible influence of Abe and also on the Kishida government. And those numbers aren't great. So um, 
there's clearly a, a maybe a cost to be paid for that. But I think, you know, certainly when it comes to influencing the direction, the policy direction of the party, um, you know, with, you know, May, you know, it's hard to get the, the exact number of what you would call the party's right wing, but there's a significant uh, minority of the party that I think, you know, will will follow him and, and listen to him. And that's, you know, that's power uh, of a sort, I mean, different than the premiership. So um, it's hard to see him necessarily jumping back into that. But, you know, he's, he's certainly not going quietly. Um, and on the second part, I don't, in terms of changing how the LDP is campaigning, um, you know, you know, Kishida, I think, was was singing a different tune during the campaign and really sounding themes that sounded a lot similar to the kind of messaging that we've gotten uh, from, you know, the opposition and their joint manifesto and also in the CDP's manifesto, you know, talking about redistribution and Kishida talking about an end to neoliberalism and, you know, various themes that we've heard from the opposition. But again, you look at the manifesto and you look at the kind of approach they're taking, uh, the manifesto explicitly endorses continuing abinomics. So, um, which has plenty of redistribution and plenty of Keynesianism. So let's not, let's not kid ourselves in terms of what, it, what kind of policies were pursued. I mean, it was not um, you know, small government uh, deregula deregulatory neoliberalism uh, during the Abe years. But uh, the messaging, I think, you know, had Kishida had the, had the platform and had the campaign messaging been exactly the way Kishida wanted, um, it might have sounded a lot more like the opposition, but I don't think we've seen that. And instead, we've seen what Amy helpfully put up. We've seen a lot of the red baiting, um, you know, and trying to play on fears of, of the Japanese Communist Party, which seem uh, a little overblown um, in this year, 2021. But um, I mean, that we've seen plenty of messaging, you know, and, and national security, I think, you know, lurking in the background there as well. Um, you know, what, you know, can you actually trust, you know, these parties uh, with the defense of Japan? I think that has been uh, in the background. Um, but thanks for those questions. Thanks, Tobias. So I have a pair of um, rather provocative questions for Amy. Um, one comes from Yuki Shiraito. He asks, um, is there any reason uh, for the LDP and Komeito not to simply merge, uh, given the fact that they, um, or, or is it simply because they've been different parties for so long that they don't? Can we see them as de facto a single party? And a question from Kristen Vacasey. Uh, I'm intrigued, though skeptical, about the increase in defense spending that Kishida has suggested. What are the uh, what are your thoughts on how much space the LDP has to move spending over one percent GDP, uh, given the partnership with Komeito? What scenario do you think might make the LDP competent enough to make this move, and would really uh, that might uh, really tick Komeito off or endanger their partnership? Yes, great. So thank you to Yuki and Kristen. So. I think from for our from the standpoint of an observer, we can we should treat the LDP Kormator as being like very similar to one party. However, they're not going to merge, and I think it's because the Kormator loses all leverage if they merge. So at the moment, the Kormator and its supporters are getting things from the party. They're getting the LDP to modify its stance on say, constitutional revision and national security issues, I think, and they're also getting money for their communities. So they are, by sort of acting very, un, well, by sort of emphasising how unhappy you are with each other, you can kind of get the other person to do more for you than if you just merged. If you merged, you know, you lose all of your leverage. So that's why I don't think that's going to happen. But from our perspective, we should, we should treat them, especially when it comes to elections, as being very highly coordinated. So I hope that uh, explains, that's an answer to that question. So Kristen's question about defence spending. So what I'm interested in looking at, and I haven't looked at this yet, is whether the LDP can kind of buy off the, buy off the Kormato on policies that the Kormato doesn't like by just injecting more money into their community. So I guess I think there is room to move on matters like defence spending. I think some sudden increase to 2%, and Toby knows much more. Toby looked, you know, I, I looked very briefly at what, what exactly was said, but I think Toby looked at it in great detail. It didn't really seem like they were saying 2%. They just said sort of, for example, other countries are spending 2%. I think that the, the LDP will be able to get the Kome to, to acquiesce to an increase in defence spending, so long as that defence spending is being used defensively. I think the Komeito, you know, there's no question, they are very hesitant about some of the policies that some LDP members want to want to pursue in the security realm. But if, I think that there is room to move there. Um, they can give Komeito more spending. For example, in this election, they gave a district to the Komeito in, in SSD in Hiroshima. Um, they, they gave that district away to the Komeito. So there are, there are tools the LDP can use to get the Komeito to acquiesce to a point. 
Um, so, yeah, thank you to both of you for those questions. Great, thank you, Amy. Uh, and now uh, for Kenneth, I have a question from uh, Yuki uh, Shiraito, uh, which is, is there, did you find any relationship between the partisanship of a governor and the prefecture? Um, although this might not always be clear because a lot mm. of governors run as independents um, with, with party support and voters evaluation of their performance. And a related question from an anonymous attendee is why aren't uh, Japanese voters more angry? Why, why is it that the incumbent uh, government, governments aren't uh, taking a more significant hit uh, from not just the handling of COVID, but from all the corruption scandals um, that have been um, going on in the past mm. several years? Um, thank you very much. Um, before going in, uh, there's a point about the foreign policy dimension that I think Kristen Vacasi raised. And um, so, so the policy, what are the policy issues that are hot or that are particularly salient during this election campaign period? And in terms of particularly opposition coordination, I think two things are need to be done for it to be really effective. One is, of course, actually coordinating candidates so they're not running against each other in the same district. The second is it's useful if they have a, a unified message um, or a point of view that contrasts with the LDP. In particularly the 2014 and 2017 elections, I think foreign policy regarding collective self-defense, uh, as well as constitutional amendment, which Prime Minister Abe had been pushing very forcefully, um, gave something for the opposition, like a flag for them to rally around. But in this election, um, foreign policy is not as salient. It's certainly constitutional amendment has become less important since Abe stepped down. So I think, you know, once you get away from those ideologically, um, you could say divisive, but the polarizing issue and the conversation starts becoming about economic or healthcare management, then the LDP may have an advantage because they're seen as more competent. Um, regarding the uh, um, my, my own studies regarding COVID and local versus national governors, uh, what I've been really interested by, and people who've been studying local government longer would certainly know this, I suppose, is that um, governors aren't seen as being particularly partisan. They may or may not have run under a particular party's banner um, in the past uh, when they won, but once they're in office, they don't have an explicitly um, partisan image. Um, and so what I've basically found is partisanship affects how people view the national government, but not so much how they view their own governors or mayors. Um, and the question relating to uh, why aren't voters angry, um, paying more attention, you know, it's, I think all four of us are political scientists and we're constantly puzzled by other people don't think politics is as interesting as we think it is. Um, but uh, again, I think um, the sh at least for this election, the short election cycle has been uh, a big issue. Um, and it's, it's certainly living in Tokyo, the last few days, the news has been dominated not by um, the election, but rather, I suppose now former uh, Princess Mako getting married. Um, now that she's married, maybe we can start focusing on the election again or the news media will, but um, we'll have to see. Thank you. Thank you. And Kenneth's point about the LDP having an advantage on valence issues like the economy and, and security um, segues into a question from the Q&A from Henry Lawrence which is to what extent will the opposition party's emphasis on progressive social policies, such as the um, ability for um, married couples to keep their separate surnames um, and civil uh, uh, partnerships or same-sex marriage, uh, help them secure votes or, or, or capture a new um, cleavage uh, dimension in Japanese politics? And that's open to anybody who wants to, um, to answer it. Um, if, if I can just jump in then, um, these things like allowing married couples to have separate surnames, um, civil partnerships, LGBTQ uh, plus rights, um, the public is running much more, uh, I suppose we could say progressive or permissive on these issues than legislators are, and certainly much more than the LDP is. Um, and I, I think it has a potential to energize voters, but will it energize voters in a way that's different from how they would have voted anyway? Um, so how many voters can they convert from the LDP to the progressive side uh, slash how many um, can they turn out that would not vote? And I think this is where the Komeito coalition, uh, certainly from an ideological package, is quite valuable to the LDP because the Komeito is quite progressive on these issues. And um, in urban areas, they can convince certainly their own supporters and possibly turn some independents into thinking, you know, sure, the LDP is a little bit slow on this, but as long as we're part of the alliance, 
we can help move this discussion forward. And you know, de facto, no change uh, change is unlikely unless the LDP gets on board. So while the progressive parties may be quite vocal on this, you can trust us. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have um, a pair of questions that relate to upper house elections, and I'll ask these to the entire panel, and um, uh, any of you can weigh in. So David Bowling wonders whether the two upper house by-elections that happened last Sunday, one in Yamaguchi, which the LDP won easily, and the, the um, main opposition candidate was from the, um, the JCP, uh, and one in Shizuoka, which the LDP candidate narrowly lost to um, the opposition candidate, how might those um, uh, help us understand the upcoming Sunday general election vote? Uh, and Jesse Johnson from the Japan Times wonders, uh, will notes that Kishida will dive straight into his diplomatic agenda by attending the COP26 uh, climate conference right after the lower house election. Assuming the LDP government is still in power, uh, how might the uh, next upper house elections, which are due in July of 2022, potentially affect his approach to foreign policy? Tobias, do you want to start with that? Yeah, well, let me let me take the first one. Um, you know, I, I think um, you know, certainly the Shizuo the Shizuoka election was uh, a bit of a surprise. You know that you had um, you know Kishida and other senior LDP leaders were were committed to campaigning there. I think they were you know, certainly working on um, you know keeping that one in their column. And um, you know, so so to that extent, I mean, it, it's you know an indication you know that maybe. Um, you know, Kishida is certainly not um, uh, getting people out in any different way than Suga was, you know, where Suga, you know, had this reputation for really being uh, elect, you know, uh, an electoral liability. And of course, we saw this when he lost uh, in Yokohama, where he had been, you know, a, a powerful figure in the city government uh, earlier in his career. Um, but when you look at, um, well, one, you know, I think it's hard to, to take too much from what we saw that a by-election on turnout, you know, it's by-elections are uh, sort of their own creature. It was an opportunity for, you know, if there were local issues, um, you know, maybe get voters uh, out for that. Uh, so I don't think, you know, turnout was a little lower than in 2019, the 2019 upper house election. Um, you know, I, I just don't know if we can learn that much from it. I don't know if it tells us that much about uh, turnout one way or another uh, for this Sunday. And I think the other thing is when you actually look at what the polling looks like in Shizuoka, the opposition's not doing so well. So it's not like, you know, that that ultimately, um, you know, that voters might just, you know, that was the upper house by-election and, you know, the, up, the lower house elections could be the lower house election and the, the, the dynamics just might end up being different. I mean, I, um, you know, and Shizuoka being a part of the country where the opposition, I think really needs to do well and there just aren't the signs that they're going to have the kind of breakthrough, I think, uh, that they're going to need. So I, ultimately we might not actually have learned that much from it. May I just add, um to that. I, I also think there's quite, we don't have much to learn from these, from these by-elections. But just comparing the one in Shizuoka and the one in Yamaguchi, the one in Shizuoka had like higher turnout. Um, so by-elections in general get a lot of media attention. So I think that kind of, you know, it sort of energizes voters there. They're being told every day in the, in the news that they're kind of important. So turnout was higher in uh, Shizuoka, like 10% or I think 11% higher than it was in Yamaguchi. So that's one of the reasons I think because these people who these voters who don't who aren't attached to the LDP or the Komeito turn out and support the opposition candidate, whereas in Yamaguchi it's much lower. So the the LDP preferred candidate is totally mm -hmm. fine. So I, I think, and also the other thing I'd say about upper house elections is that the districts are really large. So the electoral strategy I sketched out that the LDP and the Komeito are doing. It works because ultimately districts are put together, like elections are won in geographically defined districts that are quite small. So you don't have to win that many votes to win in a single seat district. But in these upper house elections, these candidates need a lot of votes. So I also think it's just, it doesn't really translate as easily um, to both by-elections and upper house. But yeah, Kenneth? Yeah, no, exactly on that point. One additional thing to mention perhaps is, um, the candidate who won, the opposition candidate who won in Shizuoka was uh, was jointly endorsed by the Constitutional Democratic Party as well as the Democratic Party for the mm -hmm. People, and the latter, the Kokumi Minsho, is not in an electoral uh, or strict electoral mm -hmm. coordination in the lower house election. And you know these are vote margins. It may not influence ten percent of voters, but it may influence three or four percent, and that can make be a make it or break it, um, particularly in urban districts. Great. So uh, there's two more sets of questions I want to get at. So um, the um, 
the 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 last question about how the upper house elections in 2022 uh, might affect changes in in um, uh, policy assuming that Keisha is able to hold on to uh, a slim majority um, that is still on the table but there are some related questions so uh, if Ishin Nokai uh, manages to um, increase its uh, seat sh share um, how might this impact uh, policies and, and uh, parliamentary procedures of the LDP. So how might the LDP respond to an increase in seat shows for Ish Ishi no Kai? Um, and do we expect um, Kishida's rhetorical turn uh, towards greater redistribution uh, to result in a significant shift in policy? Um, or uh, if, if so, uh, or if not, why not? That's maybe um, best yeah, answered by Tobias, who's, okay, who's well, following the LDP closely. Well, it's hard to take in certain to the, to the first one. I mean, I think in general with the upper house election coming, I mean, you know, we saw, um, you know, Abe back in 2013 in a similar situation where wins, um, you know, forms his government and immediately is, you know, preparing for an upper house election. And, and I think that tells you that um, in general, you're going to see, well, one, I think we're already know we're going to see stimulus. You know, Keisha has already said after the election, you're going to get a stimulus package. Um, and, you know, for all we know, we'll see another one in the spring, depending on how the economy is looking. Um, and when it comes to the legislative agenda, I mean, I think, you know, the one big piece of legislation I've heard about is the economic security package. I mean, everyone kind of agrees that that's coming and there's sort of a, a, a multi-party consensus on the need for something like that. Um, but you're not going to, I don't think you're going to see anything uh, particularly bold or controversial or anything that's really uh, going to stir anything up uh, before the upper house election. And, and you know, that the, the blueprint is there that, you know, just sort of try to find a way uh, to goose the economy a little bit, make voters happy and get through that. And then, I mean, and then you realize too, that again, looking back to, to Abe's you know, first, first term, I mean, once you get through that, I mean, now, you know, he would have three years potentially without having to, to face another election. And then that gives you some time if he can somehow get through, um, Sunday with a with a decent enough majority it can get through the upper house election. Then you might have uh, you be in a, in a you might be in a position to start maybe taking some risks um, without having to worry about facing the voters for a while. And so that really is the time to watch. But before the upper house election, it's hard to expect too much um, in terms of of bold policy. Okay, I want to get one one last question uh, and a pair of questions um, that um, maybe each of you can uh, weigh in on. So uh, one person in the Q&A, um, Koji Shiromoto, Shiromoto asks whether uh, maybe this election is the end to the perpetually reorganizing opposition parties from the DPJ to the Minshinko to Kibo to the Democratic Party for the People and now the CDP. Uh, do we expect there to be um, a lasting um, you know, period of, of CDP as a, as a main opposition party? And John Campbell poses a, an even bigger question. Is Japanese politics party or electoral ever going to change. So other democratic governments seem to show more change than uh, Japan. Why the difference? Do you have any big an answers for whether the 2021 elections might um, uh, at least um, be an omen of, of, of some shift or, or uh, permanent change in, in Japanese politics? Kenneth, do you wanna start? We'll go in reverse order. Sure. Um, on uh, the opposition coordination or you know, will the, will the opposition party stabilize? Um, I don't think so. Um, one wild card in this election coming up was whether or not uh, the Tokyoites first party um, was going to field national candidates. And uh, they initially said they were going to, and then they pulled out because of a lack of time and frankly, lack of support from their patron, um, Koike Yuriko. So I think there's always embers of people frustrated with the current lineup of opposition parties. And um, hopefully it'll stabilize at some point. It'll make my um, teaching slides much easier if I don't have to keep on adding new names. Um, but I'm a little bit pessimistic. And regarding uh, John Campbell's question about is politics going to change? Uh, one thing that I think Abe uh, particularly during his second administration, was very successful at was marshalling the powers of the Kante, of the of the prime minister's office and the cabinet office generally. And there have been uh, significant reforms that date back to the late 90s, but are still continuing about consolidating power away from the ministries, away from the political parties into um, the cabinet's office, uh, which is enabled by their ability to control um, personnel much more effectively. Um, these are tools, it's not clear if Abe was able to wield them because he was in office for so long. Was he in office so long because he wielded them well? 
But there's, I think, in a way, the, the power balance within the architecture of Japanese governance has changed. The Abe demonstrated how you could use it. And um, if Kishida can do something similar, um, we may see a type of politics that is quite distinct from what we saw in the early 2000s. Any, um, any uh, parting thoughts from uh, Amy or Tobias? Amy, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I sadly don't think the opposition has stopped reorganizing. Um, I think some of these smaller parties like Nippon Ishinokai, sometimes I think they might be angling to get into the LDP Kometo coalition as opposed to kind of being in the opposition camp. So I think there are like dual motives going on. Some opposition parties really want to fight against the LDP and present an alternative to the people, but other, but then their, their efforts to do so are hampered by the fact that some of their party members may eventually bandwagon with the LDP and some other small parties may emerge with the goal of actually joining the governing coalition as well. So I think the opposition are really facing an uphill battle right now because of these structural factors that I identified. So I think it's just going to keep keep um, sort of changing. And I think um, John's we're, at, question... we're almost at the at the end of time. So um, thirty seconds uh, for for um, Tobias uh, on your your thoughts on that. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to try to take John's question very very briefly. And that is, I mean, if there's going to be change, I think we should. I don't know if we should look for endogenous change and something from the part what the parties are doing and things like that, and think more about how the world is changing around Japan and what impact that's going to have. Um, what new issues? What might? What new cleavage structures? What you know? Whether it might polarize Japanese politics in a way we haven't seen. The biggest thing for me is how reliable is the United States in the future? And if there are doubts about the U.S. role in Asia, the U.S. role as, as a as Japan's ally, that's going to have untold impacts on Japanese domestic politics and going to scramble coalitions and, and force. Uh, different political alignments and different political battles. And that, I, I think we should be thinking more about exo exogenous shots to Japanese politics and looking for endogenous change. Well, we are at the end of our time, uh, but I just want to thank uh, the audience for coming to this webinar and uh, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and APEC Study Center for sponsoring it. And especially big thanks to our speakers, uh, Tobias Harris, Amy Katalinak, and Kenneth McElwain for uh, a really enlightening conversation. After the election uh, on November 10th, Wednesday, November 10th, we'll be holding a post-election roundtable. Um, what happens and what happens next, uh, featuring Yusaku Horiuchi from Dartmouth College, Yusola Kwan from Utah State University, and Charles McLean from University of Michigan, who will be looking at the data uh, from the election and uh, interpreting it for us and, and giving us uh, uh, their thoughts on, on what it may be um, suggests about the future of Japanese politics and U.S.-Japan relations. Uh, so please join us next time and uh, thank you again very much for a wonderful webinar this evening.